What is up, everybody? Brian Mendler back in your life on another edition of the podcast. And today I am super excited to be joined by two guests. My first time ever having two guests. I have Santi Sanders with me and I have Mike Lastra. So both from Florida. And let me just kind of lay out for everybody how this sort of happened. I was talking to Santi recently. I'm coming down there to do some, or I was supposed to come down there to do some work. We're going to do it virtually. And you started talking about turning a school around from an F school to an A school. And I thought that was interesting. And I said, man, I have a lot of questions about that. So, and then you said, well, it wasn't just me. It was a couple other people. So here we are. It's good to see you all both. First of all, thank you for joining me. Hey, thanks for having us, Brian. This is awesome. It's good to see you. So Sansi, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, um, first of all, you can also tell us who you are and kind of what you do now. That'd be good too. Yeah. So um, I started teaching in right here in Florida um, 20 years ago, actually this year. So um, most of my experience when I first started out in the classroom was at uh, affluent schools and uh, most of the students were on grade level and uh, there was a high level parent and family engagement. There wasn't very many behaviors. After five or six years of that, I did some work in private schools and kind of the same population of students. Um, and then I got, uh, I moved across the town. So I switched to a title one school that, um, had some behavior issues. And that's when you are very humbled as a person and as an educator, because when you feel like you're, you're a veteran and you're going to walk in there and then those kids Mm. are going to teach you some lessons. (laughs) What did they teach you? Um, that, trauma has a real big impact Mm. on behaviors and that um, me having certain expectations of them and using kind of like a punitive system of punishment, it really wasn't gonna change behaviors. So, I I mean, I wish that if there were something that, or punishment that would change behaviors for for the positive, but in 20 years, I haven't seen Mm. one punishment that works to change behaviors. So I think for me, the shift was when a student came in and was struggling academically, I could, um, I expected students to come in at all different levels. You know, some students might be a few years behind in reading or math. And that I think as teachers, we accept, but when it's a behavior, we expect everyone to have that certain level of perfection and not realizing that there's, it's just like academics. Everyone's going to be at different spots. And the willingness to teach behaviors like we teach academics. I mean, we're willing to spend, you know, 20 minutes or to an hour after school every day with a kid working on their reading. Why not do that with behaviors? So, Mike, how did you come in the mix? Um, so I'm a, I'm a been in the district for 17 years. I'm a principal right now at Brooksville Elementary. But at the time, I came over as a as a assistant principal at that school when it became a, it was a C school. So that movement had already happened from the principal started moving it from that F to the C. So when I got there, they were a C, but the behaviors were still out of control. They did a lot of things like you're saying, academic wise, they were on point. They were moving that needle academically, but we still had a lot of behavior issues. And on my background is high school. So I spent 16 years as a high school teacher before I became an elementary assistant principal. Interesting. So it was like a, a, a brand new world to me. What kind of behaviors were you seeing? So kids running, right? I never knew about kids running. As you, you know, in the high school, kids really don't run from yeah, class, right? So school. I'm in the first day, my principal gives me the radio. She's like, oh, here you go. And then like, we have a runner. I was like, what's that mean? Right? So <laughs> I mean, we're, so kids were running, kids were in trauma. Um, when they were, when we were getting calls on the radio, kids were already, when they heard that call, they would just set them off even more. You know what I mean? So like, it was, it was a constant battle of just getting kids under control. And, and really what we tried to do when I got there, I realized, you know, kids were like, Sansi said, that punishment is not really going to work, right? I mean, kids were getting three days ISS to five days ISS in the elementary school. And I just thought that was something that was just insane to me, right? Like, what is the kid going to learn? Um, And so we really put a lot of systems in place to um, get the kids and get them back in the classroom as soon as possible. You know what I mean? So we changed our ISS procedures. We made sure that, all right, kids are going to ISS. They're going to ISS to cool down. We're going to talk to them with our social worker. We're going to get our behavior specialists involved. And they're going to let us know when they're ready for them to go back to the learning environment. And then we would get them back in there. And um, that really started changing things. I think some of the teachers were really 
kind of asking why at first, right? Because if you're a teacher and you get sent a kid to ISS and then you don't see that kid for four or five days, sometimes that, you know, teachers want that, right? But we got to explain to them. And um, Dante and I and the principal and the leadership team really had a, you know, a, a lot of time to explain the why behind this, right? We got to get these kids back in the class. And once we started doing things like that and changing those mindsets, we really were able to start seeing better gains academically from our students that really, let's be honest, need to be in class. How do you guys though specifically do that? Like, how do you, how do you go about changing the mindset of a teacher or, you know, from, from the punitive mindset of, you know, yeah. write them up, kick them out, you know, detention in school suspension, suspend the sort of one, two, three, four, five consequence system that we see everywhere. How do you go about changing that? And, and what did you change it to? Like what, when you change something, you can't just you know, one of my rules is you can't just eliminate something without replacing it with something else. So what did you go about replacing it with for either one of you? Well, um, this is where I really love that research, Brian, because my, my position now is looking at evaluating what we're doing to see if it's effective for students. And it's not about placing blame. It's looking at those student outcomes. So I think every teacher wants what's best for students. And when you look at the outcomes and they're not where we want them to be, we have to try different things. So I think um, just using that data to show that these students who are missing 10 days of OSS, um, that we're taking away the opportunity for their relationship with the teacher, first of all, and then we're really taking away the opportunity for education, which is what they're there for. Once you can get teachers to realize that um, the behaviors will change as a result of building that relationship. And I think, um, me having taught in EBD classrooms and ESE classrooms, I could speak to it that once I created that environment in my classroom, that was um, like a sense of belonging and um, they trusted me, then I had them. And um, as soon as I had them, then I could start making more demands on them and I could get them to see their potential. But I had to extend the trust first. And then once I extend that trust, um, most kids, I think, are, we, we don't give them enough credit. They're able to adapt to the environment that they're in. So they know a lot of times what's right and wrong. I only had two rules in my classroom, which was um, be kind and work hard. And really, the kids knew if what they were doing was, you know, following one of those rules because we have to give them more credit. Um, it's better I think um, like what Mike was saying, we had a school-wide initiative at um, where our school was, where everyone was involved. Mm -hmm. So that is the reading coach, guidance counselors, MTSS, any support staff that was, we weren't the disciplinarians. So if there was a student that was needing a break, those teachers were trained to look for signs of escalation and realize that we needed to deescalate that quickly before those hormones got out of control. Right. But so how do you go about teaching yeah. teachers how to deescalate? Like what's the process or how, and, 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 or how do you get them to buy in? So one of the things with the buy-in Brian is, you know, really getting them involved in the process, right? As an administrator, mm -hmm. if I'm over here and I say, Hey, don't write kids up, you know, with too many kids are in ISS. Now you just have some resent there. Right. So one of the things, and the main thing about changing that mindset is getting the teachers involved in the process and, Talking about the why, I think you brought up a good point, Brian. You said that pathway, right? That that infraction, 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 discipline, right. ISS, OSS, expulsion, right? That's really a it's a true pathway. But what is the point of all those things on that pathway, right? And having that conversation with the teachers, why are we doing this? Perfect example: mm -hmm. we had an infraction issue where there were four infractions, and they were all things that really didn't even need to be written down on a documented paper, right? right. You know, one, one example, and I talked to the teacher and actually after seeing you speak, I talked to the teacher because the other infraction was student mumbled under their breath, <laughs> asked them what they said and, and they argued with me and that was the infraction. So like right. getting them to be like, and I, I, you know, when you, I've heard you say multiple times, like that's the dumbest question of education, right? What'd you say? <laughs> right. And and when we, we talked about that, though, like, why, you know, so here's the thing. Are you writing them up because they said something in their breast or because they argue with you? Because they argue with you because you kind of called them out in front of everyone else. And now that right. happened, right? right? You pull them to the side and talk about it. So really just getting the, the why behind it. And what are the purposes of these infractions? What are the purposes of these disciplines? Because if it's changing behaviors, 
then we can really work with something and figure out what to do instead of that, whether it be, you know, um, some type of restorative practice type thing, whether it be something like even a work detail, right? Something other than getting them out of class. Right. Or is your purpose, and we let's have an honest conversation, is your purpose to go right down the pathway? Because sometimes that is, you know, kind of in the back of my mind, right? Oh, I just want, I don't want this kid in my class. Right. I think once we did that, teachers were on board. You know what I mean? Because that's the thing. You have to get teachers on board. I think discipline data is such a, it's such a manipulative data set. You know what I mean? Because you can literally have some administrations that go in there and say, don't write kids up. And one thing we really made a point of is saying, if kids break the rules, they break the rules. But let's figure out how to get them not to break the rules again. And let's all be on the same page. And what Sansi said too was huge is when we go to respond, everyone was on the radio, right? So it wasn't just an assistant principal who's going to be the person that works with the discipline, whether it's restorative or not. It's going to be an MTSS coordinator responding that already has a relationship. It's going to be a reading yeah. coach that responds on the radio. So right. now you have all these people that are almost like welcome faces to a kid in crisis. Right. Uh, right. You know, big Mr. Lasher walks in, oh, here we go. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah. that was the other thing too, that the teachers were able to see that. And I think it's also important that teachers see that every time they remove a kid and every time they call for help, they, they strip away another layer of their own power. I mean, it's, it's like the mom who says, you wait till daddy gets home, he'll yell at you. Like any mom, any good mom knows you don't do that. Like you say the opposite. I don't care if daddy ever comes home, sit your butt down and eat your dinner. And it's like, you know, the mindset is that I can handle things myself. And I want to be clear, like, that doesn't mean that I think a teacher should always handle things themselves. Right. But I think that like understanding that that's a part of it, that every time you do that, you're going to potentially hurt yourself is an important thing because I don't think teachers see it that way. And just to clarify, like the, um, the, the, when the, the dumbest question reference that you made, which I agree, like it's, it's when, you know, a kid, when you say, knock it off or cut it out, or please be quiet as a teacher and you start walking away. And as you're walking away, a kid will almost always mumble under their breath. Right. And, and I always tell teachers like, listen closely to the mumble. Cause usually everything the kid is saying is true. Right. They used to, <laughs> they used to always call me a tall, skinny, bald, high pants wearing. And I used to be like, yes, yes. Yeah. Good job, kid. Like you hit the nail on that, you know, but so often like we'll stop and turn and what did you say to me young man or what did you say to me young lady and the truth is you already know what they said and the last thing you want them to do is repeat it but hear it differently like i always see the teachers hear it differently like instead of hearing the kid mumble that pretend they mumbled this excuse me mr mendler but right now i have to call you a couple names under my breath because if i right. don't i'm gonna look like a wimp in front of the entire class and i can't look like a wimp in front of the entire class everyone knows that so could you please be the mature adult with a college degree and continue walking away from me because i have to eat lunch with these guys and i have to ride the bus with them and i have to be on the playground with them and i have to play sports with them and i have to be around them all day long after all mr mendler what do you tell us to do when someone calls us a name on the playground you tell us to just turn in walk away well how come you can't you know after all mr mendler what do you tell us to do when someone says something else that we don't like you tell us to just ignore it well how come you can't and if you did i would really appreciate it thank you very much sir like if a kid mumbled that would anybody go marching back and the truth is i think that's exactly what kids are saying in the only way they can say it they can't say it any other way so they call me a name or two under their breath the only issue that i that i get from teachers pushback on that is a lot of times teachers will say to me okay yeah but if i let one of them do that and right. I walk away, then they're right. all going to think it's okay to do that. Mm -hmm. And the response to that it for me is just telling the kids what's going to happen before it happens. So what I always do is I always look at my class early in the school year and I say, listen, I just want to let you all know, unfortunately, and this is unfortunate, unfortunate, but some of you in this class this year are going to do and say some rude, nasty, inappropriate, not nice, mean things. I know you are. How do you know, Mr. Mendler? Good question, little eight-year-old. Here's how I know. It <laughs> happens every single year of my life. I just want to let you all know right now that if and when it happens, and I hope it doesn't, but right. if and when it does, I will not always be stopping my lesson to deal with it. It doesn't mean I didn't hear it, and it doesn't mean I'm not going to do anything about it. It just means sometimes I think teaching those of you that are not being inappropriate is much more important than stopping for the one or two of you who are. And then the last thing I always say to them is whatever consequence I choose to give or not to give will be between that student and their family and me and nobody else. And usually by saying that, 
they still forget. So like, you'll say, knock it off and you'll start walking away and the kid will mumble and their best friend will forget everything you said. So you know what the best friend, right? Oh, <laughs> oh. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Dang, you're going to let him say that about you? Oh, like they're giving birth, you know? <laughs> Except what usually happens there is a third kid will jump in. And like the way my kids say it is, yo dude shut up why because mr mendler said someone was gonna do that he was uh -huh. probably talking about you're stupid yeah you know and then i got to teach kids how to be nice to each other which is like a whole other lesson for a whole oh, other yeah. day you know yes i think brian another thing that helps for uh admin is that they give permission to teachers to do those non-academic tasks those like those morning meetings and having that time for maybe that breathing in the afternoon, or maybe we're, they were in the game. And I know working at an F school, the state is in there and they're on your grill all the time about the academic instruction, which is of course why we're there and the most important thing. But if you don't have those relationships and your class doesn't have a community, it makes it 10 times harder to teach. And so having a principal that says, if you're doing a morning meeting and I walk in, that's fine. Or if you're teaching a lesson, but Johnny's in the back and he's drawing, that's fine because I know he needed a break. So um, getting that permission to Absolutely. teachers, I think, and, and admin realizing that, you know, the academics, it, they'll come. I promise you, yep. they will come. Absolutely. And we had that situation where we let them do that, you know, and we gave them and our principal was amazing with that because I said we have to let, allow this to happen. If we allow this to happen, we're going to see a lot of gains. And once we saw that this one died to go down, we jumped from a C to an A in, in, in a two year span. So an F to an A in a, in a four year span. You know what I mean? So it, it was really something magical. And the teachers got to see that too, right? You give them the buy in. You help work with them on changing those mindsets. Yeah. And then when they see the outcome, it was, it was, it was something special. For them. So, so do you think that's the fear though? Do you think the reason a lot of teachers don't do that or some teachers don't do that is the fear of what if my administrator walks in and sees, you know, the kids got their head down or the kids wearing their hood in the back and they're not supposed to, or, uh, you know, kids over there and with their headphones on and we have a no headphones policy. And, you know, it, like, even as a teacher, if you can explain it and justify it. You think, some teachers are just really worried about that. Absolutely. I will tell you, Brian, so many times I walk in a room and there's a kid with their head down. And the, what does the teacher do right away when they see a minister? Oh, this is what Brian's over. He has his head down because I don't need to know that. You got it. I'm good. You know what I mean? So having those conversations again with like, let them do that. I'd rather you let a kid put his head down and talk to him about what was going on in his life afterwards. But guess what? The kid would rather you do that. Now, we can't let a kid do it all day long. We can't let a kid disrupt it. I even had a situation where a teacher... I said, let the kid stand then. Put him in the back. Let him stand. You know? I said, but teach him the right way to stand. He can't be jumping around and all that type of stuff. But if he wants to stand, let him stand in the back. And she was like, really? You know, like, so like having those conversations and let him, because some teachers are, and teachers need to maybe have that conversation with their administration, right? Because obviously I'm not everyone's administrator. I know mine's mindset, but there are different mindsets out there. But as a teacher, I would recommend just have that conversation. Like, listen, Mr. Lastra, Mr. Mendler, Ms. Sanders, like, I have this kid who's like kind of squirrely. Like, can I let him put his head down? If we have that conversation prior, can I let him stand in the back? And right. then that's going to go a long way with the administrator. Cause when they walk in, you're going to feel a little more comfortable. Right. And some kids are not letting anyway, they're going to do what they're going to do. Like this, <laughs> yeah. this, right. This notion that we're going to stop a kid from putting their head down is crazy. The goal, the goal, right. Is to get something from the kids. So some of my rules in education, right? Some is better than none. Yeah. Late is better than not at all. And like, so if I got 10 minutes of work out of the kid and then they put their head down for 10 minutes, what's the big deal? And some people get so upset by that. Yeah. yeah and we see that, um, we see that a lot trying to move kids from the resource setting and they're going into the gen ed setting now. And that gen ed teacher ha has, the same expectation for that resource kid right. than for everyone else. And you have to give them time. It's baby steps. Don't have those same expectations because they're getting so much from being in your classroom, much more than they were in that, in a different setting. It's, uh, it's interesting to hear you say that though. Don't have those expectations because I think a lot of times as teachers, we hear, we hear from administrators telling us that we should always have high expectations for kids. 
in every situation. And I agree with you. I think look, I'm for high expectations, but I'm also for realistic expectations. Yep, like absolutely. for looking at, like if I expect a blind person to read the board, I'm going to piss them off every time, right? Because they literally can't do it. And I think sometimes we do that as educators, but it's under the guise of high expectations for kids, which we often hear. And you should have high expectations, but that's going to look different for each student. And, um, and I learned that from having a son with autism who was nonverbal. And um, every day I expected him to talk or do whatever we needed to do. But if he didn't do that, that, that I wasn't going to give up. That was where we were going, but I'm still going to coach him and encourage him. I think we can learn a lot from coaches because they look at where, where, where you're at and where you need to go. They're not putting you up against, you know, Michael Jordan. <laughs> right. So I think it's the same thing in the classroom. You do have a high expectation for them, but you're able to get those high expectations by having a relationship first, because right. you can only, they're not going to trust you. They're not going to do, they're not going to do it. Always, right. always. And, and those, I think, go ahead, Mike. And those expectations can really, you know, we talk about differentiation and instruction all the time, right? Why can't we differentiate expectations? They're still high. They're high for every single student. Mm -hmm. But like I said, realistically, not every student's going to be here, but people are going to give you all they have if you have the, the realistic expectations. So yeah, that's a great point. Santi, I'm curious just a little bit about your son with autism. So how old is he and what, what's been sort of the journey with that? So my son, Cooper, he's a twin. I have twin boys. And um, he was a typical developing child until he was about 19 months old. And then within three weeks, he went to rocking and uh, crying all day. Wouldn't look at me, didn't say anything. And uh, I knew pretty quickly that he had autism. So um, thankfully I was an educator and I, I have seen success after success. And so I just had that mindset that we're gonna do what we need to do. We're gonna bring him as far as we can. Um, he didn't speak a word until he was four years old. Wow. So um, I had to develop a lot of strategies for how to communicate with him because he wasn't doing the same thing as everyone else. So I think being in the classroom taught me a lot of those differentiation strategies, but um, every night I would say good night to him and he never said good night back. And then one night I said, good night, Cooper. And he said it back. And that changed me because I had given up. I had given up on him saying good night. And I, I wasn't even gonna do it anymore because I, you know, you talk to someone and you don't get anything back. Um, mm. You, you kind of give up after time. But that little, little taste of success of him mm. trying to say good night to me was, it was like fuel and it was enough to just drive forward. And I think the same thing in the classroom. Um, sometimes you don't see on the outside a lot of progress, but there's a lot of things going on inside and you have to just keep, keep, keep on um, being consistent. You will see, you will see results and you will see success. Start from where they're at and where can they go next? So even though my son Cooper, um, he couldn't put headphones on, like you're wearing headphones. He couldn't have headphones on, but could he have the headphones in the room with him? And then could he have the headphones on the table for, for five minutes? Could he touch the headphones? Mm. Could he um, hold the headphones in his hand? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So no, he's not gonna on day one, put the headphones on, but over a month, he wore the headphones for 30 minutes, fine. But if I would have just said, well, he won't wear headphones, so there's nothing I could do about it. He's not gonna wear them. Then we wouldn't have gone anywhere. So it's like, well, where, where can we start? Where can we start? Can the headphones be in the house? And I think it's the same with kids. Like, okay, where can we start where we're going to be on the same page? And then we're just going to build slowly because it, it gives you a feeling of success when you're making those baby steps and, um, and the same thing in the classroom. This student might not be reading on grade level or might not be doing, you know, math, or they might be, you know, calling out, but how many times are they calling out? If they call out 50 times a day, okay, well, maybe can we go to 49? That's not right. going to be zero, but right. we're moving in the right direction. Right. And, you know, by the end of the year, you're going to see a drastic, you'll forget how that kid was in the beginning of the year. No doubt. It's no awesome. Doubt. And, and, and well, it's, it's awesome. It's so interesting, though, to hear your perspective because of going through that with your son. And I think 
that gives you a unique perspective that a lot of people don't have. And it's sort of like, that's the life you live on a daily basis, right? Like on a daily basis, you're living the life of just, they do it when they do it. And I'm not going to worry about how long it takes or, you know, what, what, they're where they're supposed to be. I'm just right. worrying about growing, you know, a, you know, a, it's, we talk about an addiction recovery a day at a time. And sometimes it's not just a day at a time. Sometimes it's an hour at a time, a minute at a time. And I think sometimes that's how it is with your own kids. And it just gives you a whole different perspective. Absolutely. And that's why I think that involving the parents, Mike and I talk a lot about this. Um, if you're not involving the parents when you're working with a student, it's like you're eliminating part of your team. It makes the work so much harder um, because they know their child. How and do you guys it, go yeah. about that involving the parents? So with us, you know, and especially at, at, the, at the other school we were at, and even now at my new school, it's really just uh, encouraging those conversations with the teachers, you know, and I, and, you know, I, the positive phone calls first, right? I mean, I tell every teacher, you need to have that positive phone call first. If I call Sansi up and say, hey, Sansi, um, you know, Carter's her other son, Car Carter's, Carter's misbehaving, you know, and that's the first contact she has with me. Right. She's going to, you know, really feel some type of way about having another conversation with me. Right. But so we have those positive interactions. And then also just, I let my teachers that they want to have a parent conference in my office more than welcome. You know, I have, I, I actually put a couch on my office for that very reason. I don't want the parents when they meet with me to be sitting across a desk, right. There's nothing more right. intimidating, especially for a lot of our parents at a title one school very rural area you know we're north of tampa but the rural set you'll see when you come down <laughs> but you know it's a lot of these parents have had a bad experience in school right so we don't they don't want to come sit across the principal's desk they don't want to come sit across the teacher's desk so i did this as an ap too i had a couch i had a whole little like almost like a living room setup in the ap's office to go ahead and like let's have a meeting in there so encouraging those things and letting them know that you support that you have parent conversation i will support you all the way along but when I call as an administrator and they, the parent says, well, what do you mean? I don't know any about, anything about any of these behaviors. That should never happen, right? And that unfortunately does happen sometimes, but that should never happen. So that's why I'm going to support you the whole way through. And if that does happen, we're good. You know what I mean? Yep. I love the idea of always leading with something positive and that's possible. Like even for the most disruptive kid, I mean, I remember I, you, you bring me back. Like I remember calling parents and being like, your daughter's the one of the most assertive people I have ever met in my, I mean, I'll tell you one thing, you know, no one's going to get her to take drugs. She has a mind of her own. I mean, she thinks for herself, she is one of the most stubborn, but I got to tell you, I love that in some yeah. ways because, you know, and like you kind of find all the positives within the next, negative. And then you kind of go into, but here's a couple issues that maybe we might be right. able to improve. And you don't even say it like even the negative, you don't even say it like it's negative. You just, it's just a, an area that I'm working with your daughter on. And what do you think at home? Are you noticing anything? Is there anything you can help me with? Right. Like always bringing them in the mix and asking them questions. I always felt like was a huge, put, give me a huge advantage. Absolutely. And a lot of those, those students that are the kids we're going to call on, right? And everyone listening knows this. They have leadership skills, don't they? Like when you think about the kid and they know it and the kids are following them, right? I have a poster of my, I used to coach rest, high school wrestling. I got a whole poster in my office of a, a whole squad of dudes that were knuckleheads. And I show them these kids became <laughs> men, but they were knuckleheads. You know what I mean? But they were leaders and we were able to harness that leadership. So now I try to do that in the elementary school, but parents can do that. They can find, I'm sorry, teachers can do that. Find that skill because all of these kids have some type of skill. And most of the kids that are misbehaving, I've seen in elementary schools, have a leadership skill. No question. No question. And and they often have the ability to get other kids to follow them. Oh, and when, when you like, right. When, and that, and, but that's the thing as a teacher, that's what you need. You, you know, I, I always say there's certain kids as a teacher that I need more than they need me. Right. Mm -hmm. I, if I can get her on my side, she'll get those yeah. other four. And that's yeah. really what classroom management is. A lot of people think classroom management is this notion of kids just sitting still doing what they're told, paying attention. And I always say to teachers, that's not really classroom management. Classroom management is getting kids to work for you. It's getting, yeah. it's, it's like, you're the CEO, but then you have like a director of sales and marketing and a director of human resources and a director of public relations. And those are certain kids in your class that yeah. you can see all of a sudden, like not every person's going to be a manager and that's fine. Like, you don't, that's the world. We don't need everybody to be leaders and managers, right. but figuring out which kids are and then utilizing them to your advantage is so powerful. Absolutely. 
Sansi, what was it like? I'm just curious, like at 19 months, what was, what is it like for you as a mom to realize your son has autism and to, to start going down that path? Like what were the emotions inside? What were you feeling? Well, um, I had just had a newborn baby. So, um, what at 19, my, my, so I had wow. a three-year-old and then I had 19 month old twins and then I had a newborn baby. So you have four so, kids. I have four kids. <laughs> Yep. They're awesome. And, um, Cooper is in the fourth grade now and he, uh, does not have an IEP. He does not have any, you know, even interventions at all. So, um, we've made a lot of progress, but, um, and that's one thing I celebrate when I, when we went to the doctor last year and, uh, he went through all the testing again and they said he no longer meets the criteria in the DSM five for autism. I, I mean, that was a moment in my life that I will never ever forget because he went from having severe autism to he doesn't even have autism. He has a language, you know, impairment. So, uh, I, I think that, I think that it was like, I'm not giving up. This is what's going to happen. I kept my eye on the prize at all times. Like this is where we're going. And no matter how long it takes or how much we have to do, that's what we're gonna do. And um, we sometimes uh, when working with Cooper throughout the day, because you have to do a lot of in-home therapy, mm. it would be rough. It was not, it's not always moving forward. You're gonna go forward, yeah. but you're gonna have some steps back too. Yeah. And you have to be able to say, okay, we're going through a phase here. I'm not sure why we're going to problem solve around that. Maybe come up with a new strategy. And I think it's the same in the classroom. Yeah. I've taught um, kids that um, had a significant amount of behaviors. And then we, I was able to get them down to none almost, but then, you know, it would be a couple weeks. Here we go again. Yep. And um, instead of me saying, well, it's not working. He needs to be out of my room. I tried, I tried this, you know, and I've done everything. Um, I think that, you have to you have to anticipate and expect that there's going to be some times where you're going to make some backward progress. Yeah. There's going to be times where they're going to be having a bad day or you're going to be having a bad day. And as long as you just keep your eye on the prize, you won't let those things bring you down because you're, you're anticipating they're going to happen. Yes. If you go into a classroom thinking yes. everyone's going to behave today and everyone's going to listen, then it's probably going to be kind of disappointing. You have to think, OK, what am, how am I going to respond when a student is triggered? because they're going to be triggered throughout the day. Right. So what do I need to do to, um, escal- to not escalate that situation? You know, one of the, one of the slides that I use in my presentation is called change is a roller coaster ride. And that's exactly what that is. It's it's, and what I do is I do an activity with people where I say, um, raise your hand if you've ever in your entire life attempted to change something about yourself. And of course, every person raises their hand. And then I say, just leave your hand up. It will naturally come down. And then I say, if you are hundred percent successful at this change for one hour, leave your hand up and most hands stay up. Cause you can usually do something for an hour and then it's a day and most hands are still up, but a couple come down and then it's a week. Right. And more people come down and then it's a month. Right. Okay. And it's got, and, and I, what I say is no slip ups. You were perfect for what, and you know, and, and then we get to three months and most of the hands now are down. Right. And then you get to a year and almost everyone in the, in, in my workshop or in the room is, has their hands down. And what I always say to them is when you're an adult and you're already motivated, it's like that, right? You're like, yo, I want to lose weight. Except the right. truth is you could have a good Monday and a bad Tuesday. And a lot of times day two of a diet is harder than day one, right? It's hard. Day two of going to the gym is harder than day one of going to the gym because day one, you're excited and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. And you're ready to go. And you got your new workout clothes. And then what happens day two, you're like, well, I had a really good day yesterday and I ate perfectly yesterday and I worked out hard yesterday. So yeah. Would today be right? And you, your your mind starts playing tricks on you. And and what I say to them is during this is really powerful to do on on virtual learning because what I say to them is um I say during the down cycle of your roller coaster ride, like so during your, in your personal life, what do you need from the people closest to you every single time? Go ahead, type it in, and everyone types in the chat, and it starts popping up like crazy. And uh, the answer is every time it's support, yeah. caring, and cr- never one time does anyone put punishment, right? Detention, be mad at me, right? 
Yeah, like never. And I always say, okay, like we just had a hundred people. You all responded. Not one of you said it would benefit you to be punished during the down cycle of your roller coaster ride. Yet frequently, that's exactly what we do with kids in school. It makes no sense. It's not what you would want as an adult. Why do you think yeah. it would benefit kids? That's so true. Yeah. And it, I know it's a powerful moment because people are like, whoa, whoa, okay, right. Okay, and then it's, what do I do instead? And it's always relationship. It's always about connection. It's always about going that extra mile, being willing to spend an extra couple minutes with a kid when you're not required to be with them. When you can look at the kid and say, just so you know right now, kid, I could be anywhere else in that whole school. This is my lunch and I'm allowed to spend it doing anything I want and I'm picking to spend a few minutes with you. That's how much I value you. And when you go to that level, kids can't help but see you different they see you different and when they see you different they start to say okay I buy into that guy and that's what it's about right it's about getting kids to buy into you as an individual mm -hmm. and you all see it right there's a reason that kids behave one place and they don't somewhere yeah. else Absolutely. and it's the same kid like yeah. so what what is happening in one place mm -hmm. that isn't in another and that's when we can get people to look in that direction usually you can get results it's hard. I mean, it is hard. I will say when you've been teaching all day and it's your break, you just want a minute. To, I mean, there were days I just wanted to put my head on the desk during that, that oh, break no. time. But I knew that if I, if I knew that if I picked like that one kid that was really that's struggling a good book in my title, class, by the way, well, that one kid, that's, a, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Somebody should, oh, yeah. <laughs> I did, but I, I, I think it's a great strategy because if you could just focus on one kid at a time and building that relationship any kid that I've ever dealt with, one-on-one, um, -on -one, they're completely different. There is a completely different than in the classroom. So I've never had a kid with a behavior problem when it was just me and the kid. Right. This doesn't happen in 20 years. So um, that's when you develop those one-on-one -on -one relationships. And then when you're in the classroom, it, it transfers over yep. quickly. It doesn't take a lot either for kids. You know, kids are awesome. So you just spending a few minutes, which it doesn't seem like a big deal to you. It makes a huge impact. And that's what kids who have visited me that are, you know, 30 years old now, 25 years old, they say, remember Miss Sanders, when you did this, when you ate lunch with me, or you went to my baseball game, right. or you said this and you, or you said I should be um, an artist, or you said, I, I don't remember that, but it was cause it was so small for me. But for them, it's stuck in their mind 20 years later. Yeah, yep. Yep. no question. We did that. And, you know, we started a mentorship program at my new school and um, put, we basically put all the kids at risk on a list and I put it out. Hey, guys, these kids need someone to talk to them. And guess what? Because in the past, I think a lot of administrators like, you know, you protect that instructional time, right? Like you can't pull them during this. I said, pull them anytime you can. Whenever you have a break, I don't care what they're doing. You pull right. them because that's more powerful than me than any 20 minutes they're going to get in the, in the instructional time. To be honest. Right. And I'm, um, you know, hope my boss don't hear this or whatever. <laughs> you yeah, but you know, but no, but, but I think it's important to view instructional time differently. Like, right. I think some people view it as like, you know, one or the other, and it doesn't have to be one or the other. Like it, you can build relationships and do instruction at the same time. It's Absolutely. about, right. It's about listening to the kid and knowing what they yes. love and, and understanding their interests and then just adjusting your content to fit it. I mean, right. you know, it's, it's like, I, I said this yesterday to a group that I was working with. I said, it, you know, if you don't start, if you're teaching math right now and you don't start your lesson by talking about football games and the Super Bowl and NFC Ch and, and using, right? A, you, like Tom Brady's 23 for 34 for 340 yards and three touchdowns. What's his completion percentage and how do you figure that out? Like, let's talk about how good he really is, but no, but not your opinion. Let's yeah. do it statistically. And like, let's look at numbers and here's the math behind it. And like working your content into the relationship so the kid in their mind is like oh we're talking about football right we're, yeah. we're talking about but really what are we doing we're actually learning math at the same time and, and that's the that relationship you know that's the thing you know sansi and um and my boss i made a joke about my boss but my boss has a shirt that says relationships before rigor it's true though yes. you know and we can find that time and and be a mentor during that instructional time pull them whenever we can it's really going to make a difference and, and, and go a long way where you have that they're coming back to see you, like Sansi said, 25 years later, you know? One of my favorite quotes is, you know, to, to rhetorically ask yourself as a teacher is, do you kick out the kid because they got in the way of the content 
or do you kick out the content because it's in the way of the kid? Which oh, one? Like, like every teacher in the world removes something from class every day. Which one do you remove, right? The only difference between certain teachers is like us special ed people, we kick out content all the time because the truth is we don't really like it anyway. Like, I mean, we're, right? I mean, so, I mean, I went into teaching not because I was interested in Shakespeare, but because I was interested in helping kids learn how to say please right. and thank you and nice to meet you and good morning and hey, how are you? And how to act interested when you're bored out of your mind. Like all these skills, right? That are crucial to the world. And so for me, it was like, oh, okay, well, wait, Shakespeare right now, or please and thank you, Shakespeare, or please and thank you. See you later, Shakespeare. Why? Because <laughs> yeah. I never really was excited to teach that anyway. I mean, I did it, I put up with it, but it's not why I was there. And I think kind of what your mindset is when you go into the job matters, right? And, and what you're actually there for. And I think you also see a difference in that between elementary people and middle school and high school people. I think most elementary and special ed teachers in some capacity went into teaching because they really like kids. I'm not saying that's not true for middle school and high school teachers, but I think there's more middle school and high school teachers who went into teaching because they like math or they like science or they right. like social studies. Well, if you went into teaching because you like math, then kids are in the way. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm here to teach yeah. math. That kid's in the way. See you later, kid. It makes sense that that would be your mindset. Right. right. So it's, it's changing that mindset within an adult, which I think sometimes is hard to do. And Brian, when I've met with uh, teachers and we do PLCs, we're problem solving about what we can do for some of the students. When we run out of ideas, we've exhausted everything. I say, OK, what if I were going to give you one million dollars? If you were able to, to move this kid or meet our goal, mm. what would you do then? <laughs> and suddenly the room has a lot more ideas about what we might do to get, to get that kid to move. So I think just kind of asking yourself questions like that, like my son Cooper, I have no alternative. There's nothing left. If I don't get him to where, as far as he can go, he's gonna end up in a home. He's go I'm going to pass away and he's not going to be able to take care of himself. Right. He's going to live in a home. So keeping that in my mind, what do I need to do for that not to happen? So when you have that sense of urgency, yep. your air locks a lot of creativity inside you that you didn't know you had. And um, it'll make you frantic to, to, for solutions, which is where you need to be in those situations. So if you're going to get a million dollars, suddenly your brain is able to come up with a lot more solutions. <laughs> Right. No question. No question. Mike, what brought you into this, into this profession? Like what, what, what's your personal life story? So, um, you know, I started out as a high school football coach and, um, high school wrestling coach. So I played college football and I wanted to coach to be honest, you know? And so it's so funny. I never at, at 23, when I graduated college, I, I just want to coach football. I want to make those relationships and give back to, to a sport. Um, but, you know, as you know, a lot of times athletics is a lot to do with, like, I think it always goes hand to hand with leadership. Like I always tell my, my, my teachers now I'm their coach. You know what I mean? Yep. I bring up like the, the Patriots all the time, right? They don't, they don't just sit around. Obviously they didn't have good this year, but you know what I mean? Every single year they're, they're trying to get better. So we're trying to get better. But that was my kind of background is I wanted to coach, but then more and more I got into it. I built a relationship with kids in the classroom, right? Of course I have relationships with my athletes. That's easy, but right. I'm building relationships with kids in the classroom. My science, my, I taught biology for uh, 15 years. So my, my, my science scores are doing well. I'm building relationships. I became team leader. So then that leadership, it just started to grow. Oh, I'm going to go to school. And then I found myself with the opportunity to kind of go to the elementary school, which everyone thought I was a little crazy. Um, but I love it. I've never, I'll never turn back. You know, being at an elementary school is something that I think is my calling, even though I've never taught elementary in my life, right? Mm -hmm. I think that the kids need to see those role models at elementary school. So, I mean, it was, it was just a blessing for me to choose. I did have an opportunity to go to a high school as an AP. I chose the elementary school because I had the opportunity to work for a great leader. Obviously you turn the school around yeah. and, and, but the elementary school, like you walk around campus, I'm a big dude, you know what I mean? I'm six, three. So you walk around campus and you're like larger than life. The kids yeah. love it. <laughs> Hugging kids left. It, it, it's just such a cool thing being at an elementary school. And that's really where my passion has become. I tell you know, a lot of my teachers, they know my background. Oh, you ever going to go to high school? I said, nah, I, I love it here. You know, elementary school needs people that are coaches, right? The kids need it. The teachers need it. So that's kind of my background is just really 
Um, what about as a kid? Were you a, were you a good student? So I was I was a I was a smart <laughs> student. She's shaking her head. <laughs> <laughs> I was a smart student, but you know I'm I'm a squirrely kid. I'm ADHD now. As you as you can see, me, I'm rocking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know my teachers know that. It's so funny. I was I was that kid that got in trouble, and I when I bring that up to my faculty, there's no shock. They laugh about it because they know that they could tell that. But guess what? That helps me relate to these kids, Brian. I because I know what they're going through. I tell them that I got in trouble in school. Now. Once I realized I could turn that 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 troublemaking type stuff into charm, I call it charm. That's why I tell right. my kids get the turn on the charm. <laughs> you know, you you have it right. I think I've seen you speak where you talk about that the kid that gets in trouble. Every lady in the front office loves that kid that gets Love in trouble. Them. Love why? Because they got right. charm. You know, right. and I, listen, I, I show right. I actually showed the clip of of you doing that. It was on YouTube to a <laughs> behavior management class for uh, St. Leo that I teach of that very scene where you reenact the kid. But that's it. <laughs> those kids have charm so like i told them that like i was a, i was a kid that got in trouble you know what i mean like i said i wasn't i was smart i know once i realized in that click switch i was able to kind of turn that getting in trouble to like teachers love me and you know just like the front office ladies love those kids so yeah i was i was a kid man i, I told my teacher my first year so at the end of the year so well now you guys know what it's like to have a principal with adhd yeah <laughs> Because, but, but that's what it is. You know what I mean? That's what we do. We, we're all about the kids here. You know? So is that, is it hard for you though, as a leader with, with ADHD? Like, do you surround yourself with people that are able to keep you organized and keep you focused? That's Listen, what I do. That is a great question. And that is a great, absolutely. I, I say it all the time, you know, at, at the other school, uh, Santi was on the leadership team with us. You know, the whole leadership team we had that our principal built, the year after we got an A, we actually all got promotions at different jobs, which you know, kind of stinks for the but it was it was a good opportunity for all of us, right? But now at my new school, my my assistant principal, they call me like the visionary guy because I'm always like da, 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 da. Right. And he's like scrambling to get those details, but he's a rock star. And you gotta surround yourself with those people. And I do that. And we, you know, we're having a lot of success here. My first year here, we were a C school, we moved to a B after my first year as principal. I think we'd have a shot at that A last year, but as you know, the school shut down. We didn't have an opportunity to uh, go. So this is the beginning of my middle of my third year here. But yeah, surrounding myself with people that are organized and that are leaders that can really take all my squirrely ideas, yeah. like you know what I'm talking about, and just kind of say this is the plan for that. Oh, I yeah. do know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too I've worked together for six years or so. We're close together, so yes. I think it's a good skill to teach kids though. I think, you know, yeah. one of the things that I used to teach kids is know, know your weaknesses, like know, know the areas of your life where you're not good and, and then surround yourself with people that are like, there were times where instead of teaching a kid to become organized, I would tell the kid, do me a favor, buddy, instead of becoming organized, just yeah. become good friends with that girl. Yeah. If you become friends with that girl, she'll make sure that you have everything you need and she'll tell you what work you're missing and Absolutely. on a daily basis. So you, you need to, you're good at the friendship part make friends with the right people so that they can help carry you through I, i'm a big fan of the show survivor i don't know if you guys watch the show survivor yeah. i love survivor and and my wife always like you know you you'd be dead on there because i'm you know I, i'll go camping if there's like a hilton at the end of the trail right so that <laughs> that part of the game i'd be a disaster but i would be fantastic at the relationship part Social. of the game and I, yeah and i always tell her i'm like i would be so good at getting everybody to be able to do things for me where i'd be just be kind of like running the show i feel like but i don't know if i could survive in the wilderness but it's that same mindset you know with kids yeah that's so funny you say that because that that's the absolute truth when you have that people skills that's a skill that you want to leverage to your to, to your like i said your strengths and weak like you said the strengths and weaknesses you yeah. have and surround yourself with people and santi and i were talking the other day about that santi right where you talked about teachers getting if you're not a good teacher with relationship building surround yeah. yourself with people that are you yeah. know what i mean right. people that are positive Right. Yeah. I think that, um, I think having that team too, cause there are going to be days where it's a hard day. And if you don't have that team around you, it, it makes it where they keep you focused on your why and lift you up when you're having a bad day, you can laugh through things because you have that team. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a huge part of our success at our, um, Mike, when Mike and I, we were on a team of great people that supported each other in our strengths and our weaknesses. And so um, if someone was going to do something, we didn't let them make that dumb choice. We're like, uh, I don't know if that's going to work, friend. And um, we had those conversations because we were, we all had a, a very close circle of trust. Right. So that <laughs> really moved the school forward. Yeah, that trust is huge when you have a team like that. Absolutely. And even I for teachers, I think um, if you're new to, if you're starting out new, the best thing you can do is surround yourself with 
those other champions for students, those other positive people that will lift you up. And whether you have that at your school or um, you go on Twitter and you, you find that community um, following people like you, Brian, where you're getting that daily kind of, um, you're getting like every day reinforced, okay, yeah. this is why I'm doing this. Let me keep focused. I think that's gonna keep those teachers from getting burnt out. Agreed. So these, these, these 45 minutes go quick. Is there anything I always like to ask people, any last bit of knowledge or information that you all, e either of you or both of you would like to leave people with? Go ahead, Sansi. That was, the, that was, that oh, was, yeah. the lo that was the longest pause we've had in 40 minutes. <laughs> I know, right? Um, you know, no, just, I think as a, as a young administrator, right? I mean, my third year as a principal here is really, taking the time for administrators, teachers, school leaders, right? Because it's not just administrators and teachers, there's so many adults on that campus to make it a priority to build relationships first. Yeah. If we take care of that, you know, we just had the schools closing, right? So in Florida, we were closed from March to the end of the year. When we reopened and we, re we did a reopen brick and mortar, the first thing I told my staff was, we are going to spend the first month of school building relationships. I, I don't care about the, you know, the instruction right now. These kids have not been around and it really has made a difference. Our kids aren't out of control. And not that they ever were, but we are, we are building those first. So I really think if we make that a priority in our everyday life, and it's not just for the students, it's also with the parents. We got to make that, you know, and I would just, you know, make that plea to teachers, build relationships with your parents from the jump. That positive relationship is going to go such a long way because they're going to be that buffer between the administrator. The administrator don't need to know if you have that relationship with the parent. You know what I mean? Like that, that you can work with the kid then. And the kid knows that you're on the same page. So really just putting that relationship first for all schools is my biggest you know, advice. And that's one of the things I've done with my staff as a new principal that has a staff that's buying into anything yeah. I'm, I'm selling them because they know I got their back. They know I'm going to support them and I'm with them. My kids know it and my families know it as well. Yeah. And I think that I think that piece is not just true in education it's true everywhere. And that's why it's so important. That's why it's so important to do and teach people and to teach kids early on that that's going to be our focus, because I think it's a good lesson for kids, like for kids to learn how to build relationships with people in their life and understanding how far that alone can take them. Absolutely. Sansi? Yeah, I think that, um, just that day-to-day -day grind can sometimes wear you down. So you have to not be, um, you have to be focused on the bigger picture. You know, you have to enjoy life and you have to enjoy teaching. If you're not having fun in the classroom, mm. the kids probably aren't having fun either in the classroom. So keeping that bigger perspective and not getting bogged down by the, don't let the, don't let the compliance issues and the paperwork and the meetings wear you down because those are not why you got into teaching like mm -hmm. you're doing an awesome job in the classroom every day and it's sometimes hard to remember that but if you keep focused on that you're changing kids lives you're having a big impact on kids lives and you're having fun with the kids and you have an awesome community in your classroom that you have control over it keeps you from getting bogged down by those little things so i think uh like following you, getting constantly um, all the books. Mike is so great at constantly bringing resources in. Mm. And so that really keeps you focused on instead of being focused on all the negative things that you hear in the news. Love it. Love it. Uh, how can people stay in touch with you or, or get in touch with you if they would like? So I'm on Twitter, uh, Mike Lasher 57 on I use Twitter a lot. That's kind of how I found uh, you know you. I went to your first ever session you know, three years mm -hmm. ago, and I've you know um, been on there. And I, I, I just think Twitter is a great resource. So Mike Lasher 57, and I know Sansi's on there as well. Yep, which is um, Sanders underscore Sansi. So there's not very many Sansi, so you should be able to find me on Twitter. <laughs> we were talking about that name. You said it's Native American. It is Native American. And I hated that name growing up as a kid. You could imagine all the, you know, what, what's your name? But now that I've gotten older, I, I appreciate having a name that has a uh, significance. And why, why did they, why did they, you, so you're, you are, are you Native American or you're not Native? They just like the name. Was yeah, there my, significance for you? Why did they pick that? My parents just wanted us to have all, all of us to have, uh, an appreciation for other cultures besides our own. So um, they loved the Native American culture 
and wanted me to have kind of that little piece. So, and they thought it would, um, it would separate me. And sometimes that's a good thing. And sometimes it's not <laughs> the good thing, but, right, right. but, um, I think it's like a lot of things that kids have. You don't appreciate it as a kid. You get older, you start appreciating it as a strength. I love the, I love the name Sansi. I think it's a cool name. And your last name is Sanders, but that obviously was, is your married name? It is. Cause I think Sansi Sanders goes well. What was it your, does. what's your maiden name? It's, it's an Italian. It's De Palma. So that doesn't go as good. So obviously I was supposed to marry uh, Jason Sanders so that I would have a good name. You can't have a bad first and last name. You got to have one. I hear you. I hear you. Well, listen, you guys, it was a pleasure getting to know you a little bit. I appreciate you coming on and, um, and thank you for the work that both of you are doing. It's inspiring to see. And I, I can't wait to get down there. You know, you, I think Sansi definitely knows this. Mike, I'm not sure if you're aware that I'm moving to Tampa. Um, I'm excited oh, nice. to come down there. Yeah, we're moving there. Um, probably we don't know exactly when we had a house and then it fell through. It was actually gotcha. on a sinkhole. Yeah. So Every they awesome found it during the inspection. Here, I know. So, but anyway, we're looking and as soon as we find one, we're having a baby in, in a couple of weeks and then we're coming after that. I can't wait. So I was oh, telling congrats. you before we started. You're really down here, bro. I know. I can't wait. Listen, you guys, I appreciate it. Everybody else, don't forget to rate. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to download. Don't forget to shout us out. I will be back with you same time next week. Until then, I say peace. I'm out of here. Bye, Ryan. Bye. Bye, you guys. Awesome job. Good to see you. I'll text you, Mike, let me, uh, I'm going to get your number too. So Santi, can you text me Mike's number? Yes. Cool. See you guys. This will right. run next Monday. This will drop. Awesome. I'll let Thanks, you know. Brian. Talk to you guys later. Thank you. All right. All right.